Time for another board game review, and this time we have the game Time Stories. This was sent to me by Asmodee, and is designed by Manuel Rozoy. Time Stories is a narrative game. Each player has the chance to take possession of a receptacle, a character from the visited world, and is free to give it the dose of roll they want. In the end, what matters is the story told and lived, in the game as well as around the table. So basically, this base game, Time Stories, is a game you can kind of only play once. It's a cooperative game where you're... I won't spoil anything about the story, but you are essentially time traveling to a certain period and you're solving puzzles and uh, trying to figure out objectives. Uh, it'll make more sense once I go into how to play it, um, but just know that this game is a game that is kind of meant to be played once. And I'll talk a little bit about how that's interesting uh, later in the review. The main meat of the game is this pack of cards. It's a giant deck. Uh, this is an entire scenario. It's a mission that your agents have to successfully complete to receive the congratulations of your instructor, Bob Lyfen. Um, each new deck you purchase follows the same basic rules and is supplemented with a few details that will be given to you at the start of your mission while at the base. It's very important you don't open this and look through it until you are about to start playing, and it'll, be very sp it'll very specifically tell you how to go through it. So at the beginning of the scenario, you are at the time agency base and you receive your mission briefing. It's then a question of you successfully completing that mission, ideally in a minimum number of attempts. An attempt is commonly called a run. A run equals a complete game, meaning the use of all of the temporal units, or TU, at your disposal. Now at this point, there may be some light, very light spoilers, just for maybe the beginning of the game and like the very first part of it. So if you don't want to know anything, maybe just skip ahead. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to be showing just a little bit of how the game works. All the missions start at the base, and this is where you learn the nature of the mission, as well as any rules specific to the scenario. And it's constructed like a location, basically a set of cards whose backs form a panorama that illustrate the scenes. So if we uh, put this here, it forms its own little scene here, and you can see what's going on here. We got Bob, old friendly Bob. Actually, not so friendly, but anyway, here is the base. In this first location, you just read the cards in uh, alphabetical order, and here, as you can see, it gives you some description of what just what's going on. Your small group moves into the room, gives you dialogue. I'm not going to go through all the dialogue, but um, basically, in the base, Bob will give you a briefing of how the location or how the uh, mission is going to go down. If you successfully complete your mission, the game will send you to a mission successful card. Uh, if you end up using all your TU before completing the mission, you must read the mission failed TU card. So there's different cards you read for different scenarios. And unless you're incredible, you will most likely fail at some point, but that's okay. That's part of the game. Up here, you can see we have a four plan cards. We set these up um, so you can get a sense of what the location looks like. Um, in this case, it is a Beauregard Psychiatric Hospital. This is the general plan of the layout, and you can use this group token to mark where you are. The scenario is made up of locations, and this was our first location, but let's remove this because uh, I just want to show you um, like the initial location you find in the game. Whenever you get a location, card A is a narration card. It tells you details about the location. In this case, uh, you are in the day room of an asylum. It's the end of the afternoon. It details also what you can look at. Like, for example, there's a nurse in charge of the hall stands. Let me actually set up the location so you can see what they're talking about. Um, so you can see there's a nice panorama in, unfolds, and you can actually see what the location looks like. And you have choices. You can talk to the nurse in the, on the B card. Uh, there's a man looking at a chessboard. Um, a young woman is painting frantically. Uh, there's a man sitting there. He looks friendly uh, in the corner of the room. Uh, there's also a painting. Some cards in a location can be sealed. Uh, so if we look at another location in the game, the promenade, um, you have the panorama unfold, um, but then these cards are actually locked. As you can see, they have symbols on them. Um, and in order to uh, gain access to these cards, you must fulfill the condition shown on the back with these symbols. Otherwise, you cannot actually uh, access them. There are item cards you can get. Um, they designate a number in order to keep their nature secret so that if and uh, they tell you to pick a certain number, you can look at it. And some of them give you very vital clues to the mystery, uh, If or some of them are just like, uh, hey, a ruby. Uh, I won't explain the importance of that, or a plunger, you know. You know, you can find random items, you can find clues. 
Um, and the game will always direct you on how to pull those cards out. Receptacle cards are the characters that you are choosing to embody or possess in the world uh, when you are sent on a mission. They all have different stats, which I'll go over. Like here's Marie uh, Berthollet, um, different stats, uh, different sort of uh, abilities and uh, quirks as well. Um, so whenever you do a new run, you can choose a different receptacle um, from among those available. Now, in a run, you have a certain number of TU, which I mentioned earlier, uh, and it tells you how much at the beginning of the game. In this one, it's 25 TU. Um, you are then transferred to a first location, and then you go through two phases that succeed one another until the allocated time runs out. You can open and explore a location, or you can change the location. Now, entering the location itself does not cost TU. All you have to do to enter location is that every player puts their pawn on a space above the card that interests them. You can debate and argue as much as you want on any decisions you make, but each player can do as they wish. Like I mentioned before, if there are sealed cards, you can't do those unless you have the uh, sealed objective or condition required to do so. Now let's say player one goes to day room B, uh, player two goes here, and player three also goes to B. Only the agent present on a space can consult the card and read its front side. If multiple agents are on the same space, to, uh, they can read the card together, or one after another. Um, you can explain to the others what's happening uh, and communicate what's on the card, but you can't show the card to anyone who is on the same space as you. So these two could look at the card, but they couldn't actually show this player what's on it. They can tell them, uh, and you can't read it out loud. You can paraphrase, you can cite, you can evoke, um, but it's so it's a, uh, in the game explains it's a telepathic power that lets you explain things. So for example, let's look at what a card looks like on the back. Like if you talk to the nurse here, um, she just basically introduces herself. Um, he, her name is Joseph Josephine uh, or Josephine. I don't know. Anyway, just some dialogue. Um, but it's important to keep note of uh, what is said. So players one and two could be like a player three. Well, okay, her name is Josephine. Um, she's uh, She's telling us about the routine of the day, that sort of thing. And then a player three could look at this, and here's a conversation with this man, uh, and he's very concerned about uh, crazies. Uh, they've taken the crazies. Um, and, you, and also, looking at the game board, all the bishops are missing. So again, that's just more information uh, that you have just uncovered by looking at the cards. Now, to do actions, you can spend your TU. Uh, you can make die rolls for certain characteristics, you can move your pawn from one space to another, or don't do anything. So let's say uh, for one TU, um, this player goes here, this player goes here, and this player goes here, so that they can look at all three cards. Uh, then you would spend the TU, and then the three players would each look at the individual cards. Once you feel like you've explored the location fully and you want to change locations, you can uh, do it in five easy steps. Uh, everyone takes their main pawn off the board and puts them in front of themselves. And then you look at the plan and look at a new location. So you can see on here, there's several locations, the infirmary, oh, we're in the day room right now, the promenade, the dormitory, the kitchen, uh, several, several choices. Now you can't split up to visit multiple locations simultaneously. You always all have to explore one location at a time. You can return to locations you've already visited and the choice of the new location is decision made by the entire group. If there's ever like an argument about what to do, uh, the game has this role called the time captain that you each uh, take turns doing, and they become sort of the chief of the current location, and uh, they read like the card A for the location, they are responsible for, responsible for TU expenditure, and they break any ties. So that's the way if you like really can't decide uh, the time captain for that location will decide. So let's say they decide to go to the promenade. Then you would remove all of the cards uh, of the current location and then put in the cards for the promenade. Then you roll this die. Ooh, okay. So you immediately have to spend three TU uh, on the timeline. Uh, this represents the time that was needed for you to change the location. So yeah, when a card or in-game effect orders you to move to another location, you roll this die. So we spent three TU. Uh, to move to the promenade. Now sometimes during a mission you may find yourself facing uh, a situation like a creature to fight or a person to convince or something like that. And you use uh, resolve these tests with the action dice. Um, the difficulty of each test is expressed in the form of shields linked to a characteristic. Uh, so let's look at this for example. Like these guys are croquet players. 
and they greet you and they ask, hey, there you are, how about a quick game? If you want to join them in a game, uh, you have to do four shields uh, and this is the characteristic that you're testing. Um, and if you pass the test, you can immediately reveal uh, this color symbol, which means you can uh, unlock more content. So take four shields. In this, in this case, there are blank shields. There's also skull shields. Um, but for this one, just a simple blank shield test. Um, in order to succeed, you must eliminate all the shields. So for Eugene Bosquet, he can roll three dice on this deftness uh, ability roll. Uh, so if, if he was on the tile and he was doing the test, uh, he would need to clear four of these, so he would take three dice and give them a roll. Uh, aha, and that's four hits. So he breaks all four shields uh, in one go. If there had been three shields and a skull shield, uh, you always eliminate the shields on the left first. So these three would go, and then this one would be eliminated. Now this was a non-combat test, but let's say there, there was a skull shield, meaning there was actual physical danger. So here's a scary looking car you could possibly encounter. This guy attacks you. Uh, you gotta, he has three skull shields and you have to fight him with strength. So you would set up uh, three skulls. And let's say that Mademoiselle Doom uh, is gonna fight him. As you can see, she has two dice for that particular characteristic. So she rolls them. And she got one hit and a skull. So she knocks off a shield off the test. Ah, but then she rolled a skull in a scenario with skull shields. Um, add the skulls showing on your dice to those present on the shields to determine the strength of the riposte. So here the test still has at least one skull shield left. So what you would do is count how many skulls were rolled, count how many shields are left, in this case it'd be a total of three, and then compare it to your resistance. Her resistance is four. She's a tough lady, um, so she brushes it off. However, uh, if the resistance, if her resistance was lower than that, she would lose a life point. Oh, and I see, she's like a glass cannon. She only has one life point, so if uh, she gets hit, she's done. Now, sometimes there are special shields that can uh, affect you if they remain on the test. For example, this type of shield, if it's left, you lose one life point for each remaining shield of that type. And if it's a shield of this type, you lose one TU for each shield of that type. Uh, so those suck. Um, so you wanna try to get rid of those shields as efficiently as possible um, with the right characters. If multiple characters are on the space, they can both uh, do roll tests against that uh, situation. If a lock is present on the card like this one, uh, you can't leave until you pass this test. You're stuck with this guy. So you can decide to complete it uh, by eliminating its last shield, uh, or if you die, <laughs> or if you decide to leave the space if you're allowed. If you eliminate the last shield, it is defeated and is removed from the game until a next run. Uh, if you come back to the same location in the current run, this guy will no longer be here, so the panorama will be visually incomplete. If multiple agents are taking part in the, in the fight, each of them rolls their die separately and applies the effect of their roll. Uh, any blank faces are ignored, and don't forget that the play order is not fixed meaning that you can choose in which order they roll their dice, uh, because that might be very critical. And once you, eliminate, once you eliminate the last shield, the test is immediately completed. If any of the characters lose their last life point, they die, and the agent possessing them is expelled into the intertemporal vortex. You need time to recover them, uh, so what happens is you remove their pawn from the board. Let's say uh, Greeny died. Their small pawn is placed 7 TU away uh, from the current position, so right here. The agent can still take part in discussion, but they can no longer do actions. Um, while they're wandering in the intertemporal vortex, their possessions, like their items or tokens they received, can be used by the other agents until they return. Um, as soon as the time marker reaches that receptacle, then they can reintegrate their receptacle. They enter for free on a space of the location currently being visited uh, that contains at least one agent, and their receptacle is once again operational with all their life points. Um, if seven TU or fewer are left when they die, they're basically just gone for that run. And if all characters are dead at the same time, the run immediately ends. And if that happens, read the failed mission TU card. Like I mentioned before, there are items in the game. There's no limit to the number of items you can have. Um, and it's usually smarter uh, to divide items be between all receptacles. You can hand items to other players as long as you're on the same space or off the board. And some items will have a special symbol, meaning that they remain in your possession from one run to the next, meaning you can kind of start with a new game plus advantage. And that's pretty much how you play. I can't go into the details of the story 
because that is the whole game and you don't want to know too much before you go into it. But basically, uh, once you read the mission mission successful card, if the game indicates you to do so, then you win the game. Uh, if you reach zero on the TU, uh, you are immediately transferred and you must read the mission failed TU card. Or if they all, if all of you die at the same time, or sometimes specific situations can cause you failure. If you fail, leave the items that are stamped with that symbol uh, that I mentioned before in place, but reset everything else to their starting places. Uh, and then you're gonna have to run back in for a second run. But what's cool about it is because you know certain things already, uh, your second run will be a lot more efficient uh, as you try to beat the game within the time limit. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much the game. It's tricky to discuss the game because I don't want to spoil the story, uh, but I hope that by laying out how the game kind of works with the locations and the actions and discovering stuff, uh, it, you kind of understand like what you're doing. But first let's talk sort of about the replayability factor, or really the lack of it. Um, so from opening the box to ending, we did a three-person group, and it took us about five hours to learn the rules and complete the entire adventure. And once that's done, since you know all the twists and surprises, you can't really replay it. I mean, I guess you could if you really wanted to, but uh, it's not going to be the same. So is it worth purchasing? Since I was sent the game to review, it's hard for me to say. I will say the game is extremely immersive. It's got great art and writing, and discovering each new location uh, in a panoramic tableau is, as you unflip, is really, really cool. Uh, the first scenario that it gives you, uh, without going into spoilers, it's creepy and unsettling and spooky. It's got a real kind of uh, creepy vibe. I also love the idea of kind of like going back for a second run after your first failure, because you will fail unless you're extremely lucky. Um, knowing that, okay, don't go there or don't talk to that person or do that or, oh, the item's here if we go there first. And trying to maximize your efficiency, it really does feel thematic like you're like, all right, we're time travelers, second run. Let's jump back in, we've got this. Uh, the dice rolling for the tests is light and fair enough, that doesn't get frustrating. Um, I almost wonder what the game would be like without it, because sometimes there's just spells of time where you have to waste TU just because of bad rolls. Like, oh, oh, I rolled all blank, so, okay. But I understand, you know, combat and skill tests, they're still satisfying, like, at their core. So I understand why they included it, uh, but just know that if you don't like that kind of thing, and that kind of, that, like, that kind of like luck-based sort of skill test uh, action bothers you, you might not like this game as much. Um, like with escape room games, uh, I really love the concept of this deck of items and cards that you uncover one by one as you progress in the story. It really feels like a choose-your-own-adventure unfolding in front of you. Um, I don't know how I feel about the whole, like, only certain players can read this card if they're on the same space mechanic. It ultimately just felt kind of really annoying, uh, considering it's just, you're just paraphrasing everything on the card anyway. I would almost maybe just not do that rule? I don't know. I mean, it's up to you if you really want to be true to the rules and thematic, like, but, I mean, it, I don't know. It, to me, it just kind of felt kind of dumb. I, I would have rather just been, all right, let's look at the cards together. It's a group game anyway. I don't really get why they do that unless maybe in other expansions there are like certain things you can't like read. I don't know. I have no idea. From what I remember, uh, there wasn't anything that was like, oh man, me reading this secretly is really making this game better. But the crowning moments of the game for me are the puzzles. There are some puzzles that just capture what a great escape room game feels like. Just that feeling of, aha, when you work together as a team and you have that fantastic light bulb moment. Okay, oh, yeah. go. Take a video of us doing the configuration oh, yes. and then tracing our hands. Yeah, there's okay. a video. Okay, so, like I said, it goes into here, all right? And then it goes here, goes up to the middle. Yeah. Which is up the middle, middle here, here. And then it goes down, loops down, down into the bend. Loops back up in the bend, middle, down, done. Right? Let's do it. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. If it's not right, I'm going to scream. Okay. okay. That's why I'm so taking a video. this goes here. Let's just check no, it. No, you, so, you want you to start right. moving them, you can't stop. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You got to commit. Let's oh, see. Can't stop. Once all right. No, okay. no, you got this. We got yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Like going this. up, going up, going up, going up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, Ooh, baby. Wow. Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> my dick. Dick. Fuck you. Oh, my dick. God. Dick. This game has some great puzzles and some great clever solutions and really satisfying moments like that. That in the story is just really interesting. So back to the original question, is it worth purchasing for what is essentially a single playthrough experience? 
Um, the game does have several modules you can purchase. Like, the whole point is that you buy the base game, and then if you like it, you're gonna buy more scenarios, and more. there's, like, different time periods and stories. Uh, but that's still gonna be extra money on top of the money you have to pay for the original game. I personally enjoyed my experience with the game. It was meaty, it had great puzzles, and I did really feel immersed in the theme of time travel and the atmosphere. I do wish it had at least two scenarios, but, I mean, I can't complain too much. Uh, if you enjoy escape room-like games and or cooperative, like, story-driven games, and you want something with, a, like, a good, solid story, I would recommend it. I think it goes for about 50, 60 bucks, I think, last I checked. Uh, and if you split that amongst, uh, like, let's say four people, 15 bucks a person, uh, I played for about five hours, three dollars an hour. It's a, I would pay three dollars an hour for a very immersive, story-driven escape room style adventure. Uh, but it's really up to you. You have to know going into this that it is a sort of one-time thing. Uh, and then you can you share it with your friends. It's not a game that has, like, stuff you destroy, like, escape room games. So you could, like, once you're done, share it with your friends or have them play it. Or people can borrow it. So if it sounds like it'd be worth it to you, and all the mechanics seem cool, and the idea of solving a mystery is interesting and intriguing, I'd recommend it. It's fun. I haven't played any of the subsequent modules, but I had a good experience with the base module and... I would recommend it. Yeah.